ISSP 99CZ short SAV. And uh, presentations uh, for today are the fifth one and the sixth one, uh, which is uh, available at Student Information System. So data file, ISSP 99, CZ short SAV, as every lecture, and uh, the fifth and the sixth presentation from SIS. So, if I do remember well, uh, last time we finished the topic of standardized normal distribution. So today, uh, we should continue the discussion about uh, sampling distribution and the concept uh, of confidence interval and then uh, the concept of uh, statistical hypothesis testing. So first of all, let's discuss briefly about uh, sampling distribution. What is it and why we use it uh, uh, for computation? So. Basic idea for the logic of sampling distribution, confidence interval, and statistical testing is following. Of course, you cannot uh, do it uh, in real world, so it's utopi, but take it as it is, it's logic of statistical reasoning. So, let's imagine you carry out the first one sample, second one sample, the third one sample, blah, 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 up to infinite number of samples. So you make all possible samples from your population and try to compute some statistics, usually some descriptive statistics, in which you are interested. We usually call in sampling something that we compute only as statistic instead of descriptive statistics. So take it as it is. It is something like descriptive statistics for our data. So for example, we are interested in mean or average income for our data, and we would ideally perform infinite number of samples. And then we would like to know what is the distribution of individual means or averages for income in this infinite number of samples. That's the logic behind. And it can be proven that if we would do something like this, so the distribution for averages or means would be following normal distribution. It means that distribution for individual means would be like this bell curve. So that's only the first insight. So, sampling distribution is distribution of some statistic in which we are interested. It can be average, it can be proportion, it can be another statistics we would like to compute. And if we do this distribution of these statistics in infinite number of samples, we have something what we call sampling distribution. And usually, these sampling distributions follow some well-known theoretical distributions and mostly normal distribution. That's why we discussed about this model last time. We will discuss also about other types of distributions such as F distribution, T distribution, chi-square distribution later, but we will only discuss that they exist and we will not discuss about their properties. We do not have enough time. If you uh, like to know more, please read some text, and uh, I can recommend as general uh, advice what to read uh, at the website, very nice uh, articles at Wikipedia you can find about statistics. So if you like to know basic, it's very, very nice uh, to read only at Wikipedia. Okay, so that's sampling distribution. Take some pictures. This is Field's example of repeated sampling. So you have here, some population, and the average, for example, in the population is three. Then you take the first one, second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one, sixth one, seventh, uh, eight, nine individual samples, and you compute averages for all these individual samples. Take only uh, <coughs> uh, 
small uh, difference into account that average for the population is usually expressed by Greek symbol mi, and average in the sample classical as in descriptive statistics is x this uh, <coughs> bar over it. So we have the first sample, second one, blah, 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 and you can see that individual averages in individual samples can be quite different from the original average. For example, here you have the sample in which average is one only. Two units below the average in the whole population. Here, for example, the average is five. Two units above average for the whole population. But if you make quite a lot samples, here we have only nine, you can draw a picture about individual means for individual samples. Here is the frequency and here is the average in your sample. And you can see that the most probable result for your sample is you will get average approximately three. And the lower the value or the higher the value, the probability to find some sample with this average, quite low one or big one, is decreasing on both sides. And it is symmetric. So that's quite easy uh, to follow that if you make not only nine samples, but if you make, for example, 1,000 samples, uh, 1,000 hundreds, et cetera, et cetera, it will be like this curve at all. So that's very easy uh, fields example you can find in the textbook. And here at this web page, you can find online simulation. So let's try whether it works. So it's only necessary uh, to copy the address into web browser. So let's try to do it. I only know that for old uh, web browsers, it uh, doesn't function, so let's try uh, by begin sampling distributions. Oh. Yeah, and here you have some population. So that's some population uh, with some average like this one, and uh, then you can ask for some samples. You can ask for five, 10,000, or 100,000 uh, samples. And then you can see what will be distribution of individual means for these samples. So let's start with the easiest one. Let's uh, ask for five samples only. And you can see the distribution of means is not very nice. It is not like this bell-shaped curve. It's some rubbish, I would say. But maybe if you make some average from these averages, it would be the same as the average for the original distribution of the population. Okay, let's add something more and uh, let's add 10,000 samples. Hmm, that's nice. And let's add 100,000. Even nicer. And you can add more and more, and more, and more, and more, and you can see it will be smoother and smoother. Maybe we will be clicking 100 times and it will be like this one. So, of course, this is not mathematical proof, but it's empirical evidence that it seems correct. You can also uh, change uh, the picture if I go back uh, by animating, so you can take only some samples by animating and you can see results for individual samples. So this is the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, etc., etc. So you can see also individual values and then computed average. So you can click many times here and see that at the end you will see the curve like this. The result is, or the important for us is, that if you make infinite number of samples, and you, for example, compute average for all these samples, you can expect that all these averages will follow this bell-shaped curve. 
And as we know some properties of this bell-shaped curve from previous lecture, we can compute something what we will call confidence interval, we discuss about it, yeah? So now we should only recognize that if we make repeated samples and we compute some statistics as average, for example, here, so all these averages will create bell-shaped curve. That's the result for us. I know it's not fantastic currently, but I hope that in a few minutes you will say, okay, it helps for another computation. So this is only property of sampling distribution. This is not final result, I would say, yeah? But you can use it for other computations. Okay, thanks a lot for your question. Okay, so I think that's uh, enough uh, for online distribution, uh, online simulation, and uh, we can go farther. So, here it is. So, we know what is sampling distribution, and uh, we should know, and we should learn how to compute. Of course, SPSS uh, will compute it instead of us, so in a few minutes, uh, we can erase all this slide and we can say, no, 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 SPSS will do the stuff instead of uh, our computation. But we should know something about standard error. So if you see the expression standard error, or mostly you will see only shortage S E, what is it? So once again, if we go back to our data. So if we have some data, some population, we can compute uh, average or mean for this data. And we can compute also something what we would call standard deviation. You know what is it, how to compute, or maybe you can go back into your notes and find it, or ask SPSS to compute standard deviation. Once again, uh, only uh, to repeat the information as it is uh, crucial for next uh, slide. Standard deviation measure the dispersion or variance of your data in original units. So if you would like to know how different interval values are, you would compute standard deviation. Okay, here you have not data itself, but interval averages for interval samples. But this is also distribution of some values, but now values are means, not original values. And you can compute the mean, and it can be proven that the mean for all these averages will be the same as average in the uh, original population. And you can also compute standard deviation for this distribution. And this standard deviation for this sampling distribution is called standard error. So if you see Description, standard error. This is standard deviation of sampling distribution. Okay, that's fantastic to know, but how to compute it? There are many, many formulas for different cases, but the easiest one, if you are measuring averages, as we did previously and we will do as the first task, so it's quite easy. If you like to estimate standard error, of mean or average, so it can be computed very easily. You have to know what is standard <coughs> deviation for your data. So S, small s, stands for standard deviation for your data. Usually you know only standard deviation for your sample. You do not have original data, so you do not know precise standard deviation, but only its estimate from your data. And if you would like to compute standard error of mean or standard deviation for these means, you have to divide it by square root of the number of cases you have in your data file. It means usually number of respondents. So computation of standard error of mean is very easy. You compute standard deviation for your data file, usual SPSS will do the stuff for you, and divide it by square root of number of respondents, or generally number of cases in your data file. So it's quite easy uh, to compute it. 
only uh, please take it as it is that some ultras use big N, I usually use small N for sample size, but it's up to you to decide which one you will take. Usually big N statistic uh, we use uh, for uh, the population size, but once again, doesn't matter. Okay, so that's standard deviation and now we have uh, to try to compute uh, uh, standard error uh, for our data and then uh, compute uh, confidence intervals for our data. So let's try uh, to compute this standard error for some average, then we will learn how to use it for proportions. This is the same style. And then we will use it for computation of confidence interval. We will explain what is it and why we use it. So if you would like, for example, uh, to compute standard error uh, of mean, uh, in our case, for example, for uh, income level. So the variable B41A, the fifth one, in our data file, we would like to compute uh, standard error of mean. It means standard deviation for individual averages uh, if we would uh, repeatedly sample our data. So first of all, if we would like to compute anything once again, it's necessary to check the data and if necessary, then define some missing values. As we did it previously, it's not necessary to repeat it again, so I can help you and say, okay, for this variable, B41A, we have to exclude zeros, then six times eight, and six times nine, as these values are artificial. No income, no response, or refusal. So, if we go into variable view, and the fifth row, B41A, we will define three missing values. So once again, variable view, the fifth row, and missing, and we will type zero, six times eight, and six times nine. Only to be sure it is correct for our analysis. So these are omitted from the analysis and we will compute without these artificial values. Okay, that's it. So we are prepared for computation. And now let's start with small steps, how to compute uh, standard error of the mean. So we will, for example, use classical procedure for descriptive statistics, and then I will show you that some procedures compute it automatically, so it's not necessary to remember this formula and apply it. So let's start with hand on example. Uh, so first of all, analyze descriptive statistics, and the second one procedure descriptives. So if we take the fifth variable income to the right window, so we will decide to compute some basic descriptive statistics for income. So by default, SPSS will compute the average or mean, and then standard deviation, and then uh, SPSS will also show you maximum and minimum uh, and uh, sample size. So that's enough for us. So let's click on OK, and let's see your results. So, the average income, but we are not interested currently in the average, is uh, approximately 9,700. And standard deviation is approximately 6,022 crowns. And the sample size is 854. So this is the sample size of valid uh, data about income. Okay, and now it's quite easy. So if we would like to compute standard error, so we would take standard deviation and divide it by square root of sample size. Of course, I do not expect that somebody will compute in his or her head uh, these very silly figures, 
but uh, we have some special tools. So for example, I will use uh, Microsoft Excel, if there is any. Let's try, no, once again. Yeah, here it is. Uh, and uh, if you type the formula, so it's 6022 uh, uh, divided, it's not functioning, okay, so we have to change the keyboard. Okay, yeah. so, and uh, in Czech, excuse me, uh, the square root uh, in Microsoft Excel is called odmocnina, uh, so 854, so now we are back in the Czech version, and the result is 206 approximately. So that's our standard error for our data. Okay, that's fantastic, but still, I would go back uh, to previous question why we use this concept. So now, let's try to show why we use this concept. So, if we go back to previous discussion about standardized normal distribution, so you know that this distribution follows these properties. Here, there is some average. It's usually zero for standardized normal distribution. And if you take the range, which is from minus one till plus one standard deviation, so this space cover approximately two thirds of all values. If you take the space from minus two till plus two, approximately, so this space covers approximately 95% of all values. And the logic of uh, computation of confidence interval is following. You usually compute some basic descriptive statistics from your sample, such as mean. So we know that the mean in our sample is approximately 9,668 check rounds, of course, in this case. So we also know that individual averages, its sampling distribution follow the curve like this one. And if you take the average from your sample and you make the range plus two and minus two standard deviation, you will cover approximately 95% of all possible values for the average. And that's the logic of generalization from the sample to the population. So you have some sample and this is average in the sample. And you would like to know what is possible value in the whole population. As usually, if you perform the survey with 1,000 people, and you will tell, okay, okay, I don't know anything about Czech population, but I know that in my 1,000 uh, uh, <coughs> sample, the result is following. So you will be fired from your research position. As you are expected to say, no, I know that in the Czech population, maybe the average income is blah, blah, blah. And for this reason, you take the average and you compute some interval with some probability, 66 percentages, 95, 99, it's up to you to decide, but we will uh, see that there are some recommendations about this level. From this value, by adding and subtracting the standard error. So for example, in this case, if you would like to know 95% confidence interval for the average income in the Czech population, so you would take this figure and add and subtract two times the standard error, two times as 
we know that minus two and plus two range covers approximately 95% of all values. So that's the logic behind confidence interval. It's slightly more complicated, but we will not go into details. Okay, now we will show basic computation demonstration, and then we will go back to pictures, as I think it will be uh, even easier uh, to understand it by picture. So, once again, we will go back. Here in this procedure, it was quite problematic, as we have to take standard deviation, sample size, compute standard error, and then compute confidence interval. So it's many, many uh, operations, and it's quite boring to compute it by hand if you have computer. So now let's see how to compute standard error as well as confidence interval by computer. So if you go back into SPSS menu analyze and descriptive statistics, now please choose the third procedure which is called explore. So the third procedure called explore. And the logic is very easy to guess. So you will choose income variable as our dependent list variable, as you would like to analyze this variable. So dependent list means which variable you would like to analyze. And nothing else is necessary to define as by default, SPSS will compute for you standard error, confidence interval, and many, many other descriptive statistics. So let's click on OK. And let's visit the first table which is prepared for you. So the first, what you can see, is the mean. I think it's not a big surprise. This is the same value as we have seen previously. This is another procedure, but of course, the computation of the mean is the same. So we know that the mean is slightly below 9,700. And you can see that by default, this procedure will also compute for you standard error. Okay, it's 206 point blah, 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 some small values. And it seems that our computation was correct. Or maybe that SPSS is correct. It's up to you to decide whether we are correct or not, but both values are the same. So it seems that we are correct as well as SPSS. And you can see next two rows, which are described as 95% uh, confidence interval, lower and upper bound. And if we would like to compute it by hand, it would be easy. This is mean plus minus two times if it is 95%. We will discuss about another possible settings, but this value plus minus two times this value, this is lower and upper bound, excuse me, for this range. So now, what is the result from substantive point of view? So we estimated possible values of average income in the Czech population with 95 percentages confidence, or you can replace confidence by probability. This is the same expression. So this is confidence interval for the average income for the whole population. So we try to generalize from our data, from the sample to the whole population. That's the logic behind. If we go back uh, to previous discussion, so you maybe also remember that we discussed about standard error, uh, which is related to skewness and kurtosis. And we discussed that you can make the ratio of skewness or kurtosis and its standard error, and if it is above two, so uh, the variable doesn't follow normal distribution. We will discuss about this logic later uh, as it is basic for statistical testing. But also for skewness and kurtosis, you can compute standard error by some special formula. We will not discuss about it, but it's possible. Okay, so let's go back to our slides. So if you like to compute standard error or confidence interval, you will use 
explore procedure for mean, and you can also use the same procedure, we will show this example in a few minutes, for proportion of binary variable, but if you like to use it, you have to recode your data to follow zero one coding. We will discuss uh, about this reason. And now the question is, we will discuss uh, also later how to compute the same confidence interval for nominal or ordinal data with more than two categories only. Okay, so once again, go back, and if there are any questions, feel free to ask me, as uh, this is crucial concept uh, for later discussion. So, confidence interval, usually you can also find in the literature CI only, is something which tries to cover or estimate the value in the whole population by the range or interval or uh, the band with some probability. Confidence means probability, that you believe in it with some probability. Now, this is maybe the most problematic part of uh, this uh, lecture. Mostly, especially in social sciences, we compute 95 percentages. Uh, but the question is, why not to compute 94, 90, 99, 97, etc., etc. But there were some recommendations approximately 100 years ago uh, in uh, well-known textbooks uh, from Ronald Fisher, and nearly all statisticians uh, followed uh, Fisherian's uh, recommendation, and that's why we are mostly computing uh, 95% uh, uh, confidence interval, and we are not discussing about it. But if you like to compute another level uh, for percentages uh, uh, for confidence, it's up to you, and I will accept it. As there is no golden rule that only 95% is correct value. But mostly, and you can see it also in SPSS, that by default it computes 95. Okay, so if you have normal distribution, once again, this picture, we know that if you take mean plus minus two standard deviation, you will get 95% of all values. And the logic of confidence interval for mean is the same. You will take the mean from your sample and you will add and subtract two times standard error. And it covers approximately 95% of all values. And now, once again, the question I know is not very polite. Are there any questions about this concept? As you should understand it. It's not necessary to remember from one to compute it uh, by SPSS is enough, but you should understand what is it about. Is it clear? Okay. Maybe let's see in the test <laughs> or in your homework. Okay, here you have, once again, picture from Fields textbook and uh, now maybe there will be more discussion about what is confidence interval in reality. It is slightly, slightly more complicated. So here you can see repeated samples. These are averages, these points from these individual samples. Uh, this value 15 was original average in the population. And you can see that individual samples are different as we previously discussed. And here you can see confidence intervals from these individual samples. And you can see that some here, the first one, second one, and the third one samples, and their confidence intervals computed from these samples are out of the real value in the population. So now we will slightly redefine 95% confidence interval, and we will say, okay, so we are not sure by the probability of 0 0.95 of 95 percentages that we cover the real value, but it's only true that if we repeatedly sample our data and we will compute in finite number of confidence intervals from our individual samples, so 95% of all these confidence intervals will cover the real value in the population and five percentages will be outside of this range. 
So still, if you compute your confidence interval, you cannot be sure by 95% that you cover the real value. That's the end of the story. Quite sad one, excuse me. But this is the logic behind, and I don't want to lie you as many statistical teachers usually do in uh, elementary classes. So that's the logic. Okay, and uh, from previous discussion, we know that compute uh, confidence interval is easy once again through explore procedure, and computation is quite easy. Average or mean, plus minus two times standard error as we previously did. So uh, that's not necessary to repeat. But now we will do very similar stuff, uh, but uh, the variable will not be cardinal, so we will not be precisely interested in mean, but we will be uh, interested in proportion. Usually for proportion, uh, in statistics, uh, we use small p. And if you would like to use precise formula for standard error or confidence interval for proportion, let's take, for example, uh, that you would be interested in the proportion of people who achieved uh, university education. And maybe that in your sample, uh, the value is 0 0.4. So uh, about uh, four people out of 10 followed university education and other people followed uh, some lower levels. And maybe you have 1,000 of respondents in your data file. And you would like to know how to compute standard error and how to compute confidence interval. So if you'd like to know formula, it's not also quite complicated, but uh, take it as it is and it's not necessary to remember, it's not necessary to write only for your information. So uh, instead of standard deviation divided by square root of number of respondents, it was previously, we have to slightly change the concept. So in the denominator, still we will have square root of sample size. This is the same style. But standard deviation for proportion, it can be proven, can be computed as you will take square root and you multiply proportion by one minus the proportion itself. So square root of P multiplied by one minus P in brackets. This is standard deviation for this distribution with binary variable. So if you would like to compute this standard error and then of course confidence interval, which would be plus minus two times standard error if it is 95%, so you should apply this formula. But it's not necessary to remember if you have some software and you have some procedure for computation of standard error or confidence interval for mean, so it's quite easy to follow the logic. Only you have to prepare your data and these data or your variable uh, which you are interested uh, about proportion must follow zero one coding. So let's do it. So once again, we will go back and we will decide uh, which variable we would like to analyze. So I would propose, for example, uh, to use uh, the six one variable, which is about participation in the last election and uh, only we have to check uh, possible values. So for simplicity, you can uh, check that there are three possible values. One participated, two didn't uh, participate, and uh, the third one option is didn't have right to vote. So maybe we are interested in the proportion of people participated in the last election for the whole Czech Republic. So we will compute proportion in our data and then we will compute confidence interval. So first of all, we have to prepare variable which will follow zero one coding. Usually the property, for example, here, yes, I uh, participated. 
in which we are interested, we would code as one and other values will be zero. So first of all, we will change the coding. So transform and recode into different variable in uh, the SPSS menu. And let's start. So our input variable is the sixth one, last vote participation, and new one name I would propose, for example, vote or something like this. Some very simple name. Then please do not forget to click on change. And we will assign that from original B1, we will create new variable called vote only. And then some assignments for all the new values. So the first assignment is that original value, which was one, yes, I participated, will be also one in new variable. So one will create also one. And for all other values, so the last one option, we will say new value will be zero. So all other values will be recorded as zero. Okay, else zero. Continue and okay. And you can check your data. So if we go back into data view, you can see that the last column is created by zero ones only. So it seems data are prepared. And some problems? Too slow. Too slow. So once again. So transform recode into different variable. B1. And here vote. All the new values. So I will remove and remove. And the first one is original value one is recorded as one. That's the first assignment. And the second one is all other values, the last one option is recorded as zero. Add. So only these two assignments are present here. And we have created just variable with zero one coding currently. Okay. And then click on continue and okay. And you should find the last column, which is called vote, and zeros and ones should be present only. Yeah? It works? Okay. So let's continue, and we will use the same procedure as previously. So we will go into analyze, descriptive statistics, and the third one, explore. So Analyze, descriptive statistics, and explore. And here, it's only necessary to replace income by a new one variable called vote. As we are currently interested in the proportion of people who were <coughs> participating in the last election. So, vote. And the last step, click on OK, and let's read results. So, first of all, the question is, what is proportion of people participated in the last election in our sample? That's very easy. That's mean. 0 0.7 means that 70 percentages of people in our sample participated in the last election. That's easy to guess. Here you have also standard error. So you can compute confidence interval, but SPSS will do it for you. And once again, by multiplying 100, you will get percentages instead of proportions. So you can recognize that if you would like to compute confidence interval uh, for proportion of people participated in the last election, so it would be approximately 68.3 up to 72.4 if I round up uh, for only one decimal place. So your result will be okay if you would like to know about last participation, the last election. So this range uh, 
is 95% confidence interval. Okay, and now only the last answer to previous question. We'll go back. Here it is. How to compute it for nominal and ordinal uh, variables with more than two values. So if you are interested in some proportion for a variable with more than two values, uh, so it's very easy. Once again, you record data into zero, one. One will be category in which you are interested. Zero for all others and you will do the same stuff. Okay, so here is your homework, uh, which is related to confidence interval. So please try to take one cardinal variable or you can take uh, some variable with longer ordinal scale. It means at least uh, seven points should be present. Uh, and try to find also confidence interval for proportion for one binary variable and interpret results. Okay, so that's it about confidence interval. And now, of course, I know we will not do all the stuff, but we will start new topic, which is statistical uh, testing or statistical hypothesis testing. So I will open the second one presentation which is called lecture six. And uh, let's discuss about the procedure of testing. So I will start with my quite uh, favorite analogy between statistical testing and uh, crime trial, or if you like uh, to use maybe more Czech version uh, process which is usually followed uh, after uh, the crime is committed. So let's use statistical terms for discussion about quite classical real life example about uh, uh, <coughs> crime trial. So let's take some real life situation in which some committed, uh, in which some crime was committed. So, the judge doesn't know and never will know precisely whether somebody who is before the court, usually called defendant, is guilty or innocent, as the judge wasn't present at the place of the crime if he or she was, she or he couldn't be judged for this case. He must be excluded. But at least there are some two competing hypotheses about the guilt or innocence. If we use statistical terms, we would say, okay, there is something like null hypothesis, we call it null hypothesis, this H null, that somebody who is before the court is innocent. And this is usually a trans hypothesis uh, uh, at the beginning of the uh, <coughs> crime trial. Then something is prepared by defendant, by prosecutor. Usually we call these parts as proofs. And at the end, the judge maybe will say, okay, okay, in a sense it's uh, not possible, he or she is guilty. So there is alternative hypothesis that somebody committed crime. And in reality, somebody must committed crime or is innocent. There is no third possibility. Uh, in Latin uh, law, they call it tertium non datur. The third possibility doesn't exist. So, somebody is innocent or guilty. Doesn't matter whether he or she is before the court or not. But somebody must commit the crime. If, for example, there is some other, uh, there must be somebody who is guilty. So, the judge has two competing hypotheses. No hypothesis says innocence, alternative one, or H1, sometimes it is called guilty. 
So these are hypotheses about reality, about the past. But once again, judge doesn't, uh, wasn't present at the place of the crime. So he or she doesn't know precisely whether somebody is innocent or guilty. But he have to decide. And he or she can use only proofs. And this is nearly the same stuff as uh, we are computing our statistical results. We would like to know something about the population. This is the same as crime in the past in this case. But usually we do not have data about the whole population. But we have only part of the population in our sample. And for judge, the sample is some selected proofs, some selected evidence. And maybe it can be biased. This is the same as we have data. They can be also somehow biased. And judge, and I would say also statistician, wouldn't like to make no mistake by his or her decision, as nobody would like to sentence innocent people. Maybe somebody would, but it's not <coughs> normal man or lady. So I would like as a judge, I would like as a statistician to make no mistake. Oh, okay. What can be the final decision before the court? And we will discuss later what can be the final decision by statistician. So I would say that stronger decision is following. He or she is guilty. Let's punish him or her. If we use hypotheses, so we would say that we have proven alternative hypotheses. So once again, the second one, which was present at the beginning of the process. But if judge will not prove the guilty, he or she will not say he or she is innocent. That's not the end of the uh, crime trial. What is classical end of the trial if judge is not possible to prove the guilty? What will the judge say? Excuse me, I am not able to prove his or her guilty only. But no judge will say, okay, I'm convinced he or she is innocent. That's not the goal of uh, the trial itself to say somebody is innocent. This process is following very simple logic. Punish or let it be. So if we use our hypothesis discussion, so judge will say, of course they do not use this logic of hypothesis, he or she is maybe innocent, we do not know as we do not have enough proofs, enough evidence for guilty. So that's decision for the, church, uh, for the judge. Here you have picture which is discussing uh, these competing hypotheses and the decision uh, very easily and we will show the same picture for statistical decision. So in reality, these are these two columns, somebody must be innocent or guilty. Once again, there is no third option. So that's reality, real status. And here is decision by the court. Not enough evidence, quite weak one, and strong one, he or she is guilty. And if you combine these two and two possibilities, you will get four options. Two times two table uh, is every time filled by four possible options. So if somebody is innocent and you will say not enough evidence for guilt, that's okay, fine decision. Also this one is not problematic. He or she is guilty and it's real status, he or she is guilty. But you can make also some errors. This one or this one. You can say, okay, he or she is guilty, but in reality, he or she isn't. 
and opposite can be true. You say, not enough evidence, don't punish him or her. But in reality, he or she is guilty. And now the question for you, and uh, it's only tool to understand statistical decision procedure, which error, this one or this one, is first according to your opinion, or maybe according to democratic uh, uh, values. Hmm? Which one? Third. This one? Yes. Why? Is it so? Why do you think so? <laughs> you were educated by this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is uh, somebody favoring this error as the first one? No? Okay. So we are all Democrats here. <laughs> That's quite nice to hear. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this error, according uh, uh, to democratic values, is worse, and we will see that also for statisticians, uh, this error is worse. So uh, that's why we will call in a few minutes this error as first type, and this one only as second type. Here it is. Only to remember that uh, this is more complicated and we would like to avoid it. Of course, we would like also to avoid this error, but this is not so problematic. So first type error, second type error. Okay, back to statistics uh, from discussion about uh, uh, crime trial. And uh, what is the problem we would like to solve in statistics, especially by samples? So. At the beginning, once again, we have some two competing hypotheses. We are not discussing about guilt or innocence in statistics usually. But we are discussing about, for example, whether there is or there is no difference, for example, in average uh, income between Czech Republic and Slovak Republic, uh, in uh, medians of, uh, for example, uh, uh, opinion about our happiness between male and female, uh, differences between proportions, for example, satisfied uh, 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 women and men, etc., etc. And also, usually, we have some new hypothesis which says there is no relationship between two variables. For example, we would like to find whether there is relationship between education of a respondent and his or her father. And at the beginning, we can say, okay, okay, like judge, no relation for these two variables. So, no hypothesis say, no difference, no relationship in the population. That's crucial. It is, once again, about the population. As judge follows two hypotheses about real status, about something in the past. So, we are discussing about the situation in the population but we will never know real situation in the population. We will have only proofs, our data, our sample for decision. Okay, and it's quite easy to guess that alternative hypothesis called H1 say, okay, in the population there is some difference or there is some relationship. That's alternative. That's easy to guess from the logic. So we have new hypothesis, no difference or no relationship. That's why it is called null hypothesis. No. Alternative, there is some. Okay, we do not use proofs, as we discussed previously, but we use samples. These are our proofs. And once again, we wouldn't like to make mistakes. What can be decision in statistics? So, stronger one, and that's what is usually published, is, okay, I have proven some difference, I have proven some relationship, and I will be famous, as I publish the best article in the best journal, etc., or the best book. That's largely problematic, as uh, if you follow only this logic or this strategy, you will publish only results with some difference in relationship and all other will not be published and uh, your 
uh, uh, real discussion is biased. But there can be also another decision. You say, okay, I cannot prove any effect, no difference, no relationship, as maybe I have small sample only, or maybe my sample is slightly biased, etc., etc. but I do not have enough proofs to say there is some difference or relationship. Once again, this is stronger and this is weaker statement. Okay, so once again, we are in the same table, only description for columns and rows is different. So, here we have columns which says, okay, in population, H0 or H1 is true. Once again, there is no third status. Only no difference or no relationship or difference or relationship can exist. Nothing else. And we have to decide and once again, some decisions are correct, some are not correct. We can make error, the first one and the second one, and once again, this one is worse. Okay, so once again, we call this first type error, second type error, and what we are mainly interested in, and what we would like to minimize, is probability of first type error. So probability of first type error is usually called alpha. Probability of second type error is usually in the literature called beta. And now let's try to understand what is all this alpha about? What it says? Some people uh, concluded that it is nearly useless. So maybe that this concept you shouldn't use at all, but I will force you to use it as it is quite a common procedure. So, what is this alpha probability? So, that's the probability, uh, excuse me for this mistypos, uh, there should be uh, labels from previous slides, but, uh, so I will go back, it would be easier. So, this alpha probability of first type error is probability that you say, okay, I have found some difference, some relationship, given that no difference or no relationship exists in the population. So it is usually called, it is conditional probability. As this is probability, I will say, okay, I will be famous, I will publish fantastic discussion about uh, relationship or difference, but in reality, in the population, there is no relationship or no difference. So there is nothing to discuss about, I would say. So that's alpha probability of first type error. So it's not probability of no hypothesis or alternative hypothesis. It's probability I will decide to reject no hypothesis and this hypothesis is true. So we incorrectly reject null hypothesis by this probability. Okay. So we try to minimize this alpha, uh, but there can be some more problems. If you try to have alpha very, very low, beta can be increasing so you can quite often do this second type error and you do not know what is the beta usually. And there is also well-known concept which is called power of the test. If you go back, so power of the test is the situation in which you say, okay, I have proven the effect and the effect exists. And you would like to follow quite big powers in your data analysis. There is very easy recommendation in the literature, usually in psychology, that the power should exceed 0 0.8. So probability at least uh, 
80 percentages. But uh, I have to inform you that we usually use in social sciences quite big data files, and if you have samples like 200, uh, 1,000, et cetera, et cetera, usually power flows this level. So that's not a problem. And now, once again, slightly problematic recommendation originated in Fisher's textbook uh, in 1925. Uh, and Fisher said, okay, okay, 0 0.05 would be nice alpha, and if your alpha in your data will be below this level, you are very, very happy, and say, okay, I have proven the effect. But if your alpha will exceed this level, 0 0.05, let's keep new hypothesis as being true. And we will discuss about uh, real logic, how to compute it uh, in SPSS next time, of course. Okay, uh, so uh, that's enough for today. As, uh, we do not have enough uh, time to start new topic uh, about t-tests, so we will start next time. But once again, I would like to repeat uh, that your homework from this lecture is very easy, I hope so. Compute confidence interval for one cardinal and uh, one binary variable. Uh, and interpret results. Uh, I have checked all your homework, so I hope so. I will uh, update the table uh, in SIS today. So only, uh, I don't know why, but uh, some people uh, didn't uh, add uh, counting to the last homework, so if you like uh, uh, to edit and send a new version of your homework, you can. Uh, and uh, some people, uh, but I think two uh, exceptions for only, uh, didn't interpret your results. So once again, if you would like uh, to change your score, you can. So that's all for today. If there are any questions, feel free to ask me. Okay, so enjoy once again nearly summer week, uh, and next time we will discuss more about statistical testing and confidence intervals. Enjoy the day. Bye.